Fest Los Angeles BGQ Film Festival, where it received critical raves. This is a film that could not be more relevant to our current national conversation. It centers on a live Q&A with Elegance, Chester, and participants from the film at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. This will also be simulcast across all of Outfest channels. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, um, um, hey first of all, I just want to say I'm really, really, really um, excited to be talking to you both. And I, I know that we're working together um, and we'll later, but it really watching peer kids again last night really made me um, really see what a force of nature you both are as talented filmmakers and you got something to say. So I just want to be versus being like, I'm glad that I'm lobbing on at the right time. <laughs> really wonderful. And then, but I'm going to start maybe the conversation. It's going to seem a little, um, you know, it's going to be a flow of a conversation is what I'd like to have happen. And I want to talk a bit about, um, and we're going to go into the basic things that people always ask, you know what I mean? Of like how, what, why, how much, all of that good stuff. But the thing I just, I have, that's on my heart that I have to talk about, and it devastated me. And it's something that you, um, that sort of is a bit of like a, that's a melded throughout the entire, um, the entire documentary, is how you treated that last scene and that last segment. And, um, and I know, and it's just a little bit, I know I'm coming at the very, very end of your movie, but it was so like, pop, pop, powerful. You know, when you see that young boy, you know, walking through and there's something, I don't know if he was deaf or mentally, I don't know what it was, but you saw the kindness from, a, you know, the, the police brutality, which is throughout your entire film that I definitely want to talk about, that you did this before it was as prevalent as we're talking about now, but also how someone helped him and then how you beautifully, like you did with the rest of the characters in this movie, let them be. You let them express themselves, you actually caught them. Can you talk a little bit about that, that last section? Sure. Um, You're like, maybe. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, totally unexpected. No, no one's ever asked me that question before. Really? Well, I'm glad to be the first, because it's really, well, we'll, get, we'll dive a little deeper, sorry, go ahead. That's, but I appreciate that question, because I, I mean, I guess first off, when I was making the movie, I was very much thinking about the history of Stonewall and the yes. movement, and how you know, mm -hmm. Sarah Barra, Marsha P. Johnson, things two women of color, uh, trans women of color, you know, started the riot that changed the world for gay people, you know? Yes. And, and so, like, thinking about them and thinking about the fact that it was a rebellion, that it was, you know, five, six days of rioting that caused you know, gay pride to happen. Yes. Cause gay, gays in the military, gay marriage, all that to happen. I just was so acutely aware because of my personal experience, how the conditions that gave birth to Sylvia and Marcia that made them family, how those conditions really hadn't abated in any meaningful way. And if anything, you know, after crack cocaine and, you know, Reagan and HIV, those conditions got a lot worse on the pier. Mm -hmm. so, every pride i just kept asking myself you know what happens if they riot what happens if all of these kids who are walking by these cars instead of just kind of beating on these cars and twerking on these cars were to you know pick up a stone pick up a stone you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so a part of me was filming with the reasonable expectation that, that could happen at any moment and to some degree the desire for it to happen um because mm. It's pretty sobering as a black gay person who was homeless on the pier to go there now as a filmmaker for the first time and to see like, I mean, just, I started to hate dogs while making this movie, like little specialty breed dogs. I started to despise them because you would see the white people with their dogs, Being you know, better. with mm -hmm. their dogs and feet and the dogs are doing tricks. They're like, oh, Moxie, you got so big! And meanwhile, like in the back of them, there would be like a black trans kid starving, a yeah. 
mm-hmm. one of their neighbors, you know, the, the same men who are like ogling each other's pets at night are out there, you know, exploiting those kids, buying sex from these kids at, uh, during the day, rather with their dogs, yeah. at night, buying sex from these kids. So, you know, with all of that being true, it just always felt like, I mean, and things happened on the pier, like, but right before I started filming, the, the kids, a, a young woman experienced a transphobic event inside the Dunkin' Donuts in the corner of 7th and Christopher. And she was so offended that it just kind of exploded into a situation where the whole Dunkin' Donuts got um, obliterated, like the glass out the windows, chairs tossed, cops by the dozens coming to break it up. And, you know, then another time this, one of the kids I knew, but I missed it, he, they threw a chair right. in the window of an Italian restaurant down there. So I was just kind of thinking to myself, I don't want to miss it this time if it happens. And then something more kind of magical happened than I thought I was going to get. Yeah. I also think that, I also think that Elegant uh, cared about the subject matter and he cared about the people that he was filming. And, and he is the character, the, the camera is a character itself, which is him. Right. EDP the movie. And um, I'm going to let him tell you about what Crystal asked him before she decided to actually allow him to capture her Yeah, story. I, I definitely want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. It was rules that had to do with, you know, like that cure that you're talking about and that scene looking at the boy across the street. And that's the care that was given to each of these participants in the film. We like to call them participants instead participants, of- Participants instead of characters. Totally get it. Thank you for that. And like, and always check me. I mean, we're close. We're real friends. You can always check me real quick and I'll, I'll get it. But, like, but I thought that the participant like that, it was so, you had such restraint and you let things unfold. And it was, and you could tell that each of them were, um, especially like were, were handled with care and with love. Do you know what I mean? Like it really came through and you saw like you, like just that young boy coming in and then leaving him walking, you know, across the street. We saw peril. We were like, oh my God, like something is going to happen. The police guy just pushed him and he was, it, we were nervous until someone came, got him across that barrier and then he just went on his way. And you did that with all of the participants. And, and I do want to talk about uh, your relationship with Crystal. And I think it sort of goes into my next, my next thing, which is all about chosen family. Because that's all, that was also very prevalent in this movie as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you came together with these, these wonderful participants, these wonderful people, you know, that let you in. They let you in. Yeah. That's me. Well, you know, I came to filmmaking kind of by way of an accident. I, I enlisted mm-hmm. in the Marines, and my recruiter suggested I become a filmmaker. So from there, I was taught a very kind of militaristic way of making a film. Mm. It wasn't until I got into college, my first semester of college at Columbia, that I felt like I needed to make a film to say something to the world about who I am. You know, which when I say it out loud, feels so like, you know, why would anyone care about who you are? But um, I had been through a lot to get to that stage in my life. And when I got to college and I saw like how big a deal the end of a first semester at an Ivy League school is, like I went to Columbia. And at the end of the first semester, like it was like a parade, like parents would show up and there'd be pets and stuffed animals and banners. And people were just like so excited to have these kids come home. And it made me think about, cause at that point, I'd spent 15 years away from my mother's house, yet I hadn't quite settled into a home that resembled ones that they were going back to. So, you know, what is home? Why is home? All these questions I'd ask myself. And then one day I was on the pier and walking to the pier from 7th Avenue down to the water. And um, as I was walking down and seeing some, you know, familiar faces, similar faces to mine and the warmth that they kind of had for me as I was um, walking, I realized that home is the place where one is most deeply understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so right from there. And then once I got into that place, it it was like, okay, I have to get a camera and I have to try to make a movie. So I tried to do what I learned in the military and I, I met, probably hunt, maybe like at least 30 people I interviewed initially at the beginning of the process. 
and then through various circumstances, you know, people getting arrested, people moving on, people dying, all sorts of things happening. It really quickly got winnowed down to like 10. And then I met Crystal. And when I spoke to Crystal, it just felt so different from everyone. Because one, she had just gotten to the pier when we started filming. She'd only been oh, there. Oh, really? And how long, can you talk a little, and how long of a process was that? Was like, this was done over five years? So you met her in the first year, or? First year I met, like first, I met her, if I started filming in maybe June. Mm-hmm. The movie for a class at Columbia. Um, I met her maybe in July, uh, July, August, like right after. And she was fresh in the pier, she was fresh there. Was just had been there a couple of weeks. And, you know, she spoke about wanting to be like a social worker for the community, which mm-hmm. I found super fascinating. And I thought that maybe could be a good entryway to understanding how chosen families are formed. Like, how, how is it that all of us who are from all these different backgrounds, all these different places, who end up in the same place, how are we so quick to form family with one another? You know, and, I, and when Crystal said, I'm a social worker, you know, moms do social work, all sorts of people do social work, you know, besides those who have the official title. So I committed to following her. But I tried to film her like a military film. So it'd be like, you know, you've got to sit here, you've got to look this way, and the light has to be here, and you have to answer these five questions this way. And she's I- like, I'm doing none of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what she said. She said, you know, I will not um, allow you to film my life unless you are my friend. The... You know, the camera has to be my friend. You have to be my friend. If I get caught by a cop, you're on my side. If I'm hungry, you make sure I eat. You have to be my friend, and then I'll let you film my life. And then from there, I feel like that demand is what made me into a filmmaker, which transitioned me from being a person who kind of got in a craft in the Marines to a person who was using a, an artistic medium to say something about the human condition. Mm-hmm. I really, it really resonated because I needed that and I've had that at times in my at integral moments in my life that allowed me to get out of homelessness. So to know that someone who had come from where I come from was able to articulate that need. Yeah. Made me want to just dive in and just change, radically change how I thought of making the film. So this is, it comes from a place of we are kind of thrown into the skin of oppression. One of my favorite, favorite films yeah. in Algiers. In Battle of Algiers, um, your first person point of view as both the rebel and the French occupier during the Algerian war for independence from French. Yeah. So I wanted to really use that film as a guide, kind of like Paris is Burning meets Battle of Algiers, where we drop in to this black queer nighttime world and as a homeless kid would need to talk to people to get to know who's around to see what's possible so too does the audience as the police officer interrogates you so that that kid so too does it do the audience so that you kind of get to feel what it's like to be in the skin of oppression yeah especially i mean if you sorry to interrupt i mean sorry just to no, no, it's good. No, this is a good flow. Because like, I thought, like, when I was watching it, you were also, and I'm really, I'm just really, like, praising, like, you did such a beautiful job, both of you, because I know it, it takes a lot of work as a producer to do. Like, I'm not forgetting about you, Chester, trust. Um, you had that guy come in from Wall Street, that, the, the stranger, that just sort of weirdly, like, felt entitled to invade, like, your frame and to invade their space. Can you, but that, those sorts of encounters... Like, you clocked a lot. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, they just felt, you know, like that sort of occupy, when you say occupying, that was really beautiful. Like, that was, to me, I, I thought it made a really relevant point. Like, what did you do with, like, like when that guy comes in and he talks crazy about Obama and just, like, what, like, you, and you were lovely. You were so kind. I would have been like, anyway, that's why you're you. But keep talk, tell me about that. This is the benefit of editing. <laughs> so... <laughs> you're like because i let him have it no no <laughs> no tell me because like, i was like you were having a great moment like we were getting introduced you know what i mean to crystal and her crew and like the like all of that stuff and then he just sat down so what happened can you i mean 
Yeah, sure. In the context of Occupy, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the thing, right? Like, um, very often when you watch, like, documentaries about queer Black subcultures, it's as if they exist on their own, that they're, you rarely mm -hmm. see an interaction with the mainstream re-white world. And very rarely do you see how that world really thinks about us when like you know it's very easy like some of these more academic kind of interview focused documentaries it's easy to sit down and be like oh um you know blacks are equal and women should get paid the same as men and all these things but it's you know what I mean the things that people are supposed but in to in real life they're like i was just kidding right. <laughs> right. <laughs> say so but in real life right you know it's like oh you're just some black people sitting outside and I live in Wall Street and I live on the 50th floor and my view is the entire city. And now I'm gonna come and this little strip of, of light by the water, I'm just gonna come and sit down and see what it's like to live on earth with you. And- <laughs> you know, No, but I mean like that was really, he really did. Literally what he did. He did. We were filming. <laughs> it was like, he did. He, he did. <laughs> I mean, he just walked in. He just walked in. I mean, what did you think? It's like walking into your house. It's like somebody, like, because for a lot of those people, the pier is like their living room. This is where they socialize. This is where they uh, build these bonds that, you know, as... Family. Adults, it's like, you're in, yeah, you're right. It's family. Yeah. You're like someone coming into your living room. Fuck what you're saying. I need to talk to you about why you're here. Like, what are you, what, who are you? And then it's like, it, it, he interrogated them. And, and totally. The, what was happening and didn't respect it. Right, and, and they were so kind. The, the, you know, the, they were so, they were, uh, you know, either kind, uh, this is what I'm asking you, were they being kind or were they just like over it? You know, after a while you get so exhausted about explaining, explaining some shit to people where you're just like, They'll go away soon. They will, they, they, sometimes they listen to uh, the difference to try to understand uh, why this person is treating them the way that they are. Like I do, like Crystal has true compassion. Yeah. Like Crystal is more compassionate than that white man who interrupted her conversation because of, she would show him compassion, the compassion that he necessarily would not show her. And you know, she oozes it and you can feel it too. She's her. such a good person. I mean, and, and just on that tip, how did you walk through that experience with Crystal going to see her family? Like that, I mean, like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Being black, like, I, I love, like you treated everyone with such care. You didn't judge them. You know what I mean? You showed them, you know, you let them speak their piece. Like every shot, like the boy at the end, like, you know, everybody's like, like you will tell the world who you are, right? But how did you do that when you saw her family not misgender her? You know what I mean? And really disrespect her in the name of God, right? You know, how did you walk through that? Uh, well, it was, well, I mean, first of all, at that point, Crystal and I have been filming for almost two years. And okay. I came, I, like I said before, I came by way of this film by a need to express something and without the knowledge of what that exactly was. Okay. So after two years, I kind of found myself, I'd run out of my list of questions to ask and I still felt like I didn't really know who Crystal was. So I went back to the interviews and just, you know, did a little bit of notes and I realized that her mother kept coming up and even further that our mothers kept coming up. Mm. We were always talking about losing our moms and losing connection to our moms. So I proposed to Crystal, I said, hey, Crystal, what if we could go back to see your mom? Would you be interested in doing that? Mm -hmm. I've seen you as a woman before. And Crystal was like, no, she hasn't. So I asked her that maybe in like October and around Thanksgiving, she came back and she was like, okay, I thought about it. Yeah, I want to do it. You gotta, you gotta, you have to buy me bundles. You have to, <laughs> yes. Which you know, people who know me well know I I like to play in wigs and hair and stuff. So when she said that, I was like, I okay. love you. I love you like this. I was like, and teach me. <laughs> You're like, I know. I my wig game is on. I'm like, good job. Love you, elegance. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, you buy the bundles in a bag at the hair supply store, and then you get a bunch of them, and then you you know you can cornrow your hair and sew it in, or you can yeah. you know, make a wig out of it, whatever. And that's what bundles are. So Crystal wanted me to make sure her hair was hooked up to see her family. She wanted hair, nails. Yeah. So you know, it's interesting though, but like you, this is this. Okay, sorry, but like in the in the in the dock. She has a conversation with her mother, and her mother is clearly like, I don't want to see you like that. I don't want, remember, and if I, I mean, I remember how you shot. I love I'm reminding you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where she has a conversation, and clearly her mother's like, I don't bundle. Like, it's not going to accept any of that. But she had the courage to be like, I'm going to show up as she really was. That's beautiful. Yeah. I think Crystal, Crystal loves her mother. Crystal allow in her love for her mother she allowed her mother to disrespect her because she respects her mother yeah Crystal, that's very black family mm -hmm. black family and i think that i think that crystal's love for her mother exceeds even her gender it exceeds you know it's bigger than all because of she under like crystal appreciates that her mother brought her into the world and didn't abort her you know did everything she could to take care of her you know, as a child to lead her up the right way. And her mother fell short sometimes, but Crystal understood that. And she has, to this day, still loved her mother unconditionally, which is also really beautiful about all of that. Like the mm -hmm. mother's causing this pain and her mother's hurt because of mm -hmm. the secret that's been kept for her that she's felt like has been kept for her all of this time. Mm -hmm. Crystal musters up the strength, you know? to go there and face this head on. She borrowed clothes from Elegance in order to see her mother. Oh. And her mother said, you know, when she said, I don't have boy clothes, where am I gonna get boy clothes for mom? And yes. she borrows Elegance's hoodie and she covers her head. And it's also sad because of like, you see her aunt too, struggling to love her mother. Yes, the whole thing, like church was very, I mean. At the same it was, time. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to, and you, you see them, you see her trying to be diplomatic, but still, you know, most black people worship a white Jesus. Let's just be honest. Like, you okay, know. Don't get me so Okay. <laughs> like, yes, that's true. Like, they will worship the, yeah. Mm hmm Blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus. Sure. In a sense of, uh, <laughs> and her mother and her aunt believes that treating their kids this way will get them to heaven. And that is, uh, uh, See, I don't know if I really believe that when it comes to, like, homophobia in the Black community. I do think that, like, I, I don't want to get too deep into religion because at the end of the day, religion is it's just the weeds. You know, you, everybody needs a form of faith to get through life. And sure, right. I mean, a form of faith is my thing, but I've got my own that you could yeah. use as well. So, but what I will say is that, like, you know, I think that um, the white, the moment, this moment we're having you know, almost 500 years after slavery, where as a culture, we're ready to contend with the idea of white supremacy and racism. I think uh, words really matter. And I think yes. this is maybe more the thing that we're talking about for all these years, a culture within which, you know, the color of one's skin immediately is supposed to delimit a certain kind of outcome in life. And for Crystal's family and a lot of black families, the consequences of uh, acting outside of the procreation Christian, you know, make babies, make life, be closer to God thing is kind of tough in a white supremacist environment because you don't have descendants who will endure and survive in spite of this, you know, aggressive posturing of the state. And you also don't have, you, you lose access. Like, like, I think sometimes black folks feel like, you know, they're losing black men everywhere. You know, cops are killing black men and you know, uh, jail, the, the like it goes to the prison system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trans identity and homosexuals and all they want to do is just take out black men from us. Sure, Christianity might be the lens through which that is kind of rationalized. But at the end of the day, Christian or not, the folks who are spewing this point of view, they're coming from an environment, from a, from a cultural history where they have been enslaved in every aspect of their identity has been formed and directed at them by the person, the, the institutions that enslave them, religion being one, government being another, and all of these things are at play in these moments with Crystal and her family. And I try to let, I hope that people are listening to what they say in the film, 
and doing them and adding it up as they watch it. Like, yeah. oh, this is what happens when you kick your children out. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Totally. No, I, I, I understand. And I don't want to just be clear because I don't want anyone to, uh, I don't want anyone to come back at us and to say we're at no, at no point are we saying that Christianity equals homophobia? Like, that's not what we're saying at all. No, I know, so I'm just making sure, like, we're not saying that. We're talking this particular sense and this particular context and this particular thing. So I just want to, I'm shutting that down before it even gets started. Right, you know, I'm sorry, let me take that. I'll be like, I'm just going to shut that down. But, um, but just going back more to the original, um, the original, uh, you know, sort of situation. So in that, so she sees her family, her family, she sort of, she, she's super compassionate, going to back to what you guys said earlier. She's really compassionate and empathetic and sort of lets it slide. But then we see her with her brothers, right? Is that with, and who they, and they're young, like that, that gave me hope where they're like, they gendered her, right? You know what I mean? They were like, and she's like the little, <laughs> the little sister. And I've been the little sister. That's how we all get treated. Do you know what I mean? They're like, ah, like that was nice, right? Or did I misread that? I cried when I saw that. Because the way her brothers loved on her when I first saw that scene, the, the contrast of seeing how the women in her family treated her to how the men in her family men, treated her. Right? I was like, wow. Wow. This love. They're like, you mess with Crystal, you mess with us. Yeah. And that right there, like, I wish I grew up with someone who protected me like they protect her. And, you know, beautiful. Well, it's complicated. Okay. It is complicated. I'm it's saying complicated. that moment, though. Oh, I love elegance. Elegance is like, there's more to that story. There's more to that story. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing that I wanted to do with this film, this film comes from a very, like, radical place, right? Like, Yes. And I, what I wanted to do with this film is create the movie that I wished existed when I was 14 or 15 so that my mom could kind of sit down and have the conversations in the film that her and I never got the chance to have. Mm -hmm. We're both reacting to this system that has been set up against us. And I hope that, you know, people who have, hom people who have homophobic feelings, transphobic feelings, who have kids in the foster care system watch this film and look at Deshaun's life and say, okay, maybe what I'm thinking is, I, 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 let me take a step back from this way I'm seeing my child and look at the systems that have formed us. That's really what I want people to do. And I want, and I want people to just take a step back. I want black families to take a step back. I want them to, to look at this film and think about it just a second. Do we need to kick this child out for this yeah. reason? Mm -hmm. you know? I don't think there's ever a reason. I mean, I, that's my personal feeling that like you ever kick out a child, period. Um, but like, but also, you know, um, I love that that's what you want people to walk away with. But what you've also delivered in addition to is you've delivered, um, you know, uh, you were amplifying a voice that rarely gets to be heard. And they get to talk about themselves in a very and human humanistic complicated way like i love i love of like i just boosted it and then or i still you know what i mean or i just took the little thing and then like you got to see all the things like you know and it's like and then like stole it and it was like sort of light and like oh like but that hustle is hard that must be ex when he when he said it's exhausting yeah, it's exhausting. exhausting having to do that right and then saying that like can you talk and then like what did you like how did you respond or i know it's, it's interesting when you're a documentary filmmaker there's a line of like how involved you get with your participants or not you know but it felt to me that you were part of your they were part of your family like you loved them like you loved it felt like you loved them what did you say when he was um talking about it, I, if i got hiv i'd know i'd have a bed like that um well deshaun is a real special person to me because mm -hmm. at a certain point in filming, he would always kind of like appear and disappear. Yeah. I'd say like the most profound and thought provoking things and then be gone for four months and then he'd be back again. And I said, I told Crystal this and she was like, well, did you look him up on the, on the prison system? Did you look up his name on, and see if he was incarcerated? And I was like, no, no. took me to the website and there he was. No. Yes. So no, I would say, really? Yeah, yeah. And I went to go visit him and he asked me, he was like, Elegance, you know, you were homeless, I'm homeless, I am homeless. You know I'm smart. Could you help me? If you 
could you please mentor me so I can get out of this situation? Which, I mean, you know, I read all, I, trust me, I'm a very bookish kind of person. So when mm -hmm. I started, I read a lot of documentary books and watched a lot of talks on YouTube about how to relate to what's typically called a subject. Right. You know, it was hard for me. Just, I couldn't say no because I'd done that in the past myself and someone did it for me and it helped me to change my life. You know, um, so at that point, I resolved to stop filming him. And he, for a summer, half a summer, was an assistant on the film, you know. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to get into too deep in the woods, but a lot of things happened. You know, I had an office that was broken into. I had, you know, equipment of mine that had reappeared on the street. It had been sold. Really noted. Right, yeah. <laughs> It did not go the way I expected it to go. But uh, in the middle of all that work, I remember one day he said to me, he said, Elegance, you know, I know you want me to go to college and stuff, and you went to college and you did the military. I know what you did. But for me, I don't know if it's really possible. I don't know if it really can happen. If I do all the right things, that I'm going to end up like you. It's like, I just, maybe if I saw everything on fire, uh. I could... Once I know it's all gone, then maybe I can believe there's a chance for me to keep going. You know, and it just stuck with me, that, what he said. It stuck with me forever. To see what's happening right now around yeah. George Floyd, you know, and to think about what Deshaun had to say, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to make a film, and to make this film, I had to make a community. No, I mean, because one of the things I know that we're, we're winding down, and I did want to, I want to talk about the, um, and you brought it up a little bit about George Floyd and like, and how this, um, and Deshaun, it felt like that sort of bleak hopelessness, like that sort of, that comes from exhaustion and just not seeing a better way, you know, and then, and then also, you don't, it's not uh, pointed or spotlight on it, but you felt the presence of police throughout the entire movie. And you made this movie over five years and it, and it just premiered recently, right? Like in the summer of 2019. Okay, yeah. so let, let's just be like, so it's not like this is not, you just made this last week. Can you talk about that? Of how like the police presence, like, and how that's affecting like perhaps like or the lens of, being, of what's happening today? Um, I think that what you see in Pure Kids is the end of a gentrification of the Christopher Street Pier. Uh, proof of this is you look at a movie like Paris is Burning. Pretty much every exterior in that film is shot on the pier or either on the pier or in Harlem. So compare what you see on the pier in Jenny's film, which is 1990, yeah. to what pier kids right now, and you'll see that things are like, you know, the, the, the space has been, gentrification means ethnic cleansing. Mm means ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. it means that there are populations that need to be cleared who can rise so that people who are worth more can move in. So that means that if you are black and you are outside and you are in a group, you are a threat. You, are, you represent the, 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 the devaluation of property and therefore you are high on the radar of police. So, you know, I really bristle at any notion that, you know, today is any more filled with police brutality than it was, you know, eight years ago when they were making. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you see is like, again, you're in the skin of oppression in this film. You are, you're me in this space too, and I'm them. So when a cop comes and I'm having a conversation, no matter where I'm having, I could be in Beverly Hills talking about a movie. If a cop, I'm going to stop for a second, turn my head, see if this cop is looking at me, and then once I've settled that he's not, I'll return back to my conversation, still keep an eye on him, just in case he feels like taking my life. Yep. And, you know, that's how the police are in this film. They are ever-present. Their job is to delimit black people's presence in public space in downtown spaces in New York City. If you want to talk to that. I agree with you. 
Exactly. I was going to say, like, I think you dropped the mic, sir. I think, I think that was like, that's exactly what we needed to get to. So, but before, no, it's, it's, it was really, uh, that, that was like, it was, a, it was a really strong present, but it was always that sort of like, it was always there, like at the back of your neck, right? You know what I mean? And that's how these young people are living, you know? And that's how we've always lived, right? You know, and just, anyway. That's a, that's a conversation for another day, but beautifully, beautifully put. I want to talk about now really quickly before time is runs out. What is happening with this movie? Where are we? People have compared it to Paris is Burning. People like everybody knows like it won a bunch of awards. Like it's an amazing movie. Where is it? Where can we see it? What's happening? Uh, right now. Oh, that was good. You're like, you knew that question was coming. Don't act like I'm all of a sudden throwing something at you. You know what I mean? I want this movie should be seen widely. Yeah. Where is it? Uh, right now we're playing uh, a ton of film festivals for Pride season. Um, we're looking for a distributor. We've not been picked up yet from a distributor. We're looking for distribution. I think this is a wonderful, like, I'm like, yes, great. There you go. I'm like, I'm leading. I'm like, for fuck's sake. No. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I'm like, yeah, okay. So you're looking for distribution. We're looking for distribution. Um, we really see this film being on a streaming platform because we want as many eyes as possible to mm-hmm. see Hulu and Netflix and Amazon. I think that, like, you know, uh, parents need to see this film or even a PBS because PBS is free. And, you know, parents really need to see this so that our homeless population decreases and that, you know, we take responsibility for our kids and yeah. for the world. And, you know, that's, that's important to us. And the, the, that's the next step for this film, is for us helping people who go through similar things like this and really, really, really finding distribution for this film. Crystal Elegance did something revolutionary. He gave Crystal, Casper, and Deshaun each a percentage of the film. When so, they, yes, good job. It's all about, yep, leverage and uh, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Me, what this is, is like, I just like, it's tough because you know, probably better than most, probably better than me, like how diplomatic one has to be as a creator when addressing the tastemakers and gatekeepers of the industry because they are people too. They are human too and they have feelings. However, <laughs> You know, <laughs> I love you. I love you with everything that I have. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's one of those things where I remember. I'll never forget. We were at a festival. You know, first off, we reached out. We, we had some great institutional support. You know, um, R.I.P. for now, Tribeca Film Institute, who gave us our finishing funds to do the movie. Mm. Uh, thanks to the hundreds of concerned people and film lovers who support our Kickstarter to help us get started, um, you know. But at the end of the day, what we are coming up against, well, I was at Tribeca and there's this documentary woman who told me flat out, the reason why you're having a hard time selling your film is because your film is not about celebrities, right? Your film is not like an, uh, a, bio, a bio piece about famous American designer or about an actress yeah won an Oscar and die tragically, right? Your film is- Or global warming. Or global warming or any of the things. Your film is about, you know, poor black gay and trans kids. And I had another person in my school, a teacher of mine tell me when I was editing the film, well, you know, white people want to watch movies that assure them that they're not racist. And when I look at your footage, I see black people living a kind of way that as a white person, I expect. And I don't want to feel racist, so it's hard to really take in the rest, mind you. Mm. So I guess what I'm getting at is that, you know, there are unspoken kind of segregatory boundaries around how successful or mainstream documentaries, I mean, first of all, the assumption is with any that you are making it for a white audience. That to make films, documentaries, you know, cool indies for black people. And when I say cool, I mean like, you know, the movies that are Harmony Corinne makes, right? You don't really see a lot of black folks making movies like that. You see a lot of black folks referencing movies like that. But in terms of like how blacks are depicted on screen and kind of like the, the parameters yeah. of what yeah. you are, what's encouraged and 
marketable to to depict very often what we get is like you know basically you know you can be going through the worst black pain of your life as long as you are singing and dancing at some point as long as you show the the, the industry that you can transcend this pain and achieve something of cultural value that would make me care about your pain right then your pain is worthy of consumption and and distribution when mm -hmm. we kind of live in the blues and privilege the idea of survival and the omnipresent you know unending enduring power of these forces that hold us down and we sell, we we celebrate our res our resistance to those forces and that resistance is as powerful if not more powerful than some sort of pseudo sense of triumph over those forces over, over those forces right that's where pure kids lives this is not a film about you know it's not hoop dreams i mean we're not we're not watching you know black kids leap and bound over each other into you know, the i hear you alec i mean i don't I'm sorry keep going i mean i feel you but i'm gonna push back a little bit sure. just because i mean that's what i, I was told that's what no, I'm no, i don't know i believe i know i hear you and it's just like stop talking no okay <laughs> no, no no i'm i'm fucking that's okay like I, I mean, I say when I push back, and I push back respectfully because what you've made is you've made a film that um, that is, it's not a movie. Some of those things were movies that you mentioned. This is a film. And this is something I think that transcends a lot of, you know, a lot of those things that you were talking about. And especially in this context of now where we are, where it's a like people are, there might be a possibility where people are white, black, non-black, indigenous, whatever. Everybody's ready to acknowledge of like, <laughs> This is what's happening, people. This is what this, I think you've hit this moment. Um, and it's important, do you know what I mean? And also, and here's the other thing too, like, you know, um, and I want, and I will definitely, I will pledge to like do my best to, and I think the people who are watching this, to this movie needs to be seen and it needs to be distributed. And I would highly doubt if this time next month, you don't have a few, you know what I mean? A few offers? No, I mean it. Like, cause it's, it's really, especially, um, and it's, it's, it's sorry, I keep repeating myself, but it's um, it's quite elevated, and it's back pain. It's all of those things, but it must be seen. And no, and I think by any means necessary, personally. Thank you. Thank you. Abby. Yeah, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the chance and the opportunity to to be able to tell our stories, and I'm grateful for the support of organizations like Outfest and Frameline and yeah, mm -hmm. folks like this who allow voices like ours the platform, you know, we've been, you, it, it's, a, it's a treat and a pleasure to have the microphone. I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge all of the support that we've had and, and, and think Outfest for this platform and to, you know, and to say like, you know, it's not to sound angry or bitter or any of that. It's just not, a, you don't sound angry or bitter. I think you're telling, the thing is you're telling a truth. You know what I mean? I, I just don't think it's the truth anymore, but it's a truth, a hundred percent. Yeah. Accountable for what they believed. Even when they change to the next thing, people need to acknowledge the, tr the journey it took them to go from how they thought at one time to how they think right now, especially if they're acknowledging that those thoughts were somehow mistaken, right? How do you learn from something without acknowledging that it happened? So, you know, that's kind of where I'm coming from. But at the end of the day, I, I believe that this is a story about families. Yeah. This is a story about what it means to be an American. And this is a story about the gay rights movement. This is an interrogation of that movement, right? Black trans women made it possible for us to get married and go to the military. Yes, yes. All the things that we do to survive this lifestyle that we live, black trans women laid down the groundwork. And, and black, and how do we look if 50 years later, people who look like them still live like this? What is a gay rights movement? And a film like this, I think, is it, what I'm trying to do is fill a gap. We've we're neglected working class people of color in our conversation about gay rights. We have not gone to the ghetto. We have not gone to the spaces that we have cut off from all sorts of resources, intellectual and material, right? To make sure that our message is being heard where it needs to be heard most. And that's what this film is meant to, to correct. It is not to say that it's only for black people, but if you are an ally to black people and black queer people in particular, 
Yes. Someone that can do some of the work that you don't know how to do because you were not born into this. This is also a film that needs to be taught. This is I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hopefully you all download it and watch it by a ticket. I don't know how this is going to happen. No, it's going to happen. No, I'm going to say, I think we should make this pledge that um, I think you've, you've talked about this movie beautifully. Both of you talked about it beautifully. I'm really honored to be working with you. I'm honored to even have been having this type of conversation with you. And I think that like, um, we're, you know, a closed, my granny says a closed mouth doesn't get fed. I think that we need to we need to have this movie out there and movies like that and keep it going and I think we we can we can get this movie distribution and I think that we should end on that. <laughs> yes, how you feel? <laughs> follow me at Elegance Bratton on Instagram, Elegance Twenty One on Twitter. You can also follow me at Algerno A L G E R N A L, and you can follow Pure Kids, uh, Pure Kids on all platforms. On all platforms. Yeah. Excellent. Love you. Happy Pride, Black Lives Matter. But yes, to all of that. Black trans, all right. Black trans lives matter. Absolutely. They matter. <laughs> <laughs>